welcome to the social-engineer.org podcast number 139, the Human Element Series. Hello and welcome to the Social Engineer Podcast. I'm Chris Hadnagy, founder and CEO of Social Engineer LLC and social-engineer.org and the Innocent Lives Foundation. And I've been hosting this podcast since I was a wee little nothing. No, that's not true. 2009. So I'm not I'm not that young. I'm also joined by my awesome, now no longer sick co-host, Maxi Reynolds. Hi, Maxi. Hello, I am Maxi Reynolds. I'm the technical team lead at Social Engineer and the resident attacker mindset expert. And I am no longer sick. It's going to be great. I'm going to roast you. <laughs> yes, it's wonderful. We missed you. Didn't see you for a couple of weeks and then you came back and you took another week off and it was sad. I know. I wasn't even sick. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so before we get to our guest, let me just talk about our sponsor, which is none other than Social Dash Engineer LLC. It's our company that Maxie and I work for. Uh, we're a premier information security consulting and training company. We've been around since 2003. We specialize in the art and science of social engineering. So we really focus on understanding how people make decisions, how those decisions get exploited, and then we build services around those kinds of decision-making capabilities to help your company stay safe from things like phishing and vishing and awareness assessments. You can find out more about us on social-engineer.com. But let's get to the good part. Today, we're joined by Michael F. Shine. Michael is the founder and president of Microfame Media, a marketing agency that specializes in making idea-based companies famous in their fields. He is the author of his newly released book, The Hype Handbook, 12 Indispensable Success Secrets from the World's Greatest Propagandists, Self-Promoters, Cult Leaders, Mischief Makers, and Boundary Bakers. Michael is joining us today to discuss these 12 secrets and discuss how we can all use hype for positive purposes. As you know, our motto is leave people feeling better for having met you. So that's what we really want to focus on. Mike, thanks for joining us today on the SE Podcast. Hey, Chris, Maxie, it is great to be here. It's really interesting when you emailed in and we were talking and I got a chance to look at your book. I never really thought about looking at lessons that we can learn from a positive angle from things like cult leaders or mischief makers. <laughs> so what gave you the idea, first of all, just to write a book that we can learn things from people like that? Well, I never wanted to go into business. I own a marketing agency. I really love it. I've come to like business, but I wanted to do something kind of artsy fartsy. I mean, I wanted to write novels from the age of five years old. I then wanted to play in bands and I eventually did play in a band in New York City, which my parents were not happy about when I told them <laughs> I was graduating to change rock and roll which didn't happen. However, <laughs> you know, we had probably more success than a lot of people expected it was for a couple of years. Had a following in New York. We used to sell out this club, Arlene's Grocery, a lot and have a residency there, which was where the Strokes got known as a pretty mm. well-known wow. club. Yeah. We were on TV. It was Showtime at the Apollo, but we were on no TV. No way, really? Yeah, yeah. So, and I'll tell you about that. So things like that. What's the name of your band, first of all? Yeah. And you probably, now there, we're nowhere online, but we were called The Act. And the cool. thing is, I'm not a particularly good singer. We were kind of a punk rock type band, <laughs> but we were very theatrical. And we used to do all kinds of antics, as I would say it now, hype ourselves up. So oh. the reason we went on Showtime at the Apollo was because I knew we would be booed off and that that would get us attention. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what happened. Oh, you wow. Know? Yeah. You um, wanted to get booed off. Yeah, because, I mean, we were the opposite of what they liked on that show. But right. I just knew inherently that that would get us attention. We used to have a song called Ash Wednesday, and I would dress like a nun, and I would walk around downtown and then go on stage. I mean, we would put up posters that said Dave Matthews must die, which I have been informed by a lawyer that that was a bad thing to do. Yeah, that's not not, not a great... Not a great... <laughs> <laughs> no, but it got us a lot of attention, right? And so, you know, as these things do, the band didn't work out. And I went and I got a job and it was a corporate job. And I thought I would just be there for a while to make a little bit of money, but I ended up being there eight years. And now, I, I got to ask, what was yeah. it? What is it that you did at the corporate job going from punk rocker? What was the yeah. job? <laughs> so this is actually at the crux of the story because I was hired because the company had a startup division and it was an entertainment oriented internet thing. 
which failed, but they shifted everybody into the parent company, which ran call centers. So it was about as brass tax as you can possibly imagine. Wow. And I thought I would just be there for a while, but I'm a hard worker and I started to like making money. And I don't know, eight years went by. And by the end, I was a vice president, a vice president of solution development. And I still don't know what that means, but I worked around <laughs> it. <a lot. laughs> so long story medium, I eventually left because I was unhappy. Yeah. And I decided to be a freelance content writer, as they call it, because I figured I knew business now. I was a good writer. And so people would pay me. And as it turned out, I was horrible at sales and quote unquote marketing. I had a year's worth of savings. I burned through it. It was very scary. I couldn't get people to buy from me. And then like when I was at my lowest, I had this revelation that because I had read every marketing and sales book and they were doing nothing for me. I could not master this thing. And so I just had this revelation that I used to be good at marketing, but I didn't think of it as marketing. And a lot of my heroes were like rabble rousers who attracted attention. Uh, Malcolm McLaren, who managed the Sex Pistols and hmm. Andy Warhol and people like that. But I never thought of them as marketers. So I decided to take a page out of my own book. There's a guy named Gary Vaynerchuk, who in my world is a really big deal. He's a big internet guru, one of the biggest. And I wrote an article called Why Gary Vaynerchuk is Flat Out Wrong. And I posted it and I believed that, but no one was taking this guy on. And that night he responded to me by video and I was a nobody and just lambasted me and all his fans were chewing me out. And, and I was like, my career's over. And it was like the start of my career. I started gaining all these followers. So I just started to be myself in a weird sort of way <laughs> and take that sort of attitude but in business and eventually they wanted the marketing more than the writing. So that's how my business came to be. But what I also realized was that a lot of times the quote unquote bad guys, not rock managers, they're mischief makers, but I don't know, propaganda artists, cult leaders, these kinds of people, they have an intuitive understanding of how to get people worked up and emotional to get them to do what they want them to do. And a lot of times people with good products and good services and good causes that they, they don't think that that's available to them because they think it's evil stuff. And what I realized was that it's not evil stuff. The, the principles are the principles. And you speak to this a lot, Chris, the social engineering. I mean, the principles are the principles. It's just that a lot of times the bad guys are more willing to see the world as it really is. Mm -hmm. So I became interesting to me and almost became a moral crusade to put these tools in the hands of people a little more like me yeah. and maybe even better than me, people who are really trying to make the world a better place. And so I started to become a student of it and I went in pretty deep. So when you wrote that article about that guy, Gary, is that, yeah. is that his name? Yeah, yeah. Uh, were you writing that with the thought, I'm going to get him to respond so I can get clients or were you just writing it because you really thought like this guy needs to be taken down? It wasn't taken down. It was just someone had to say what I was saying. I mean, the thing to note is that I never insulted him. This wasn't about trolling. I never insulted his face, his voice, his family. I insulted his ideas and I didn't even insult them. I called them out. I didn't really have the confidence yet to think that he would call me out personally. That was like success beyond what I could have mm -hmm. imagined. However, I both agreed with what I was saying and also felt that same sense of mischief that I used to feel back <laughs> when I was, you know. Yeah. Okay. So you playing. weren't doing it to hype. It was just another experience in your growth process. Yeah. I had the same feeling that I did when I would hype things up, which in retrospect showed me that that was the way to go. Yeah. Whereas when I was building sales funnels and sending direct emails that were following the Agora structure and all of these things that we learned in traditional marketing and sales, I didn't have that same feeling. I felt like I was doing what I was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So no, I don't think I knew enough yet to have been a strategic. I wouldn't have known it at the time. Yeah, okay. However, I tapped into that side of myself that was inspired by hype artists because I was always into not just 
music managers and bands, I always was just weirdly interested in cults and political propaganda. They were just areas of interest of mine. So I remember someone coming to school with the book when the movie The Doors was out when I was in high school. And a friend of mine was like, I just read the book about Jim Morrison. And he used to be able to put five people in a crowd and cause a riot. (laughs) And I don't know if that's true. And I don't think it's even desirable as we now, as an adult, I know. But just the fact that someone could have that power, that just always fascinated me. Yeah. How do you sell this to your clients, this idea of influencing through, I suppose, disruption? How do you get them in on that? It's a good question because in the beginning, I didn't do it as directly as I do now. Okay. Our agency in the beginning was evolved in, from the copywriting practice into an agency that worked with consultants. So the insight that I had was that if you're a consultant and you're in the business of selling ideas, you already know that your financial success past a certain level of competence is a function of being known as the dominant thinker in your space with the most unusual and interesting ideas. So the way we would market ourselves is I can find a niche, give you a point of view that sets you apart, and then do those activities that gets you known by everyone. What I would then do were experiments based on these principles that I now call hype. But just as my reputation grew, I was able to be more and more sort of direct about it. Interesting. So let's do this. Give us one of the principles. I don't want you to give all because I want yeah. people to go read the book. So give us one of the principles that you think is, you know, maybe not the best, but one of the <laughs> best of the 12. Well, well, so I gave you one, which I won't spend more time on, but that's something I call make war, not love. It's that people <laughs> define themselves against other things rather than defining themselves for things. So if you want to create a following around yourself, a tribe, as they call it now, mm-hmm. people form tribes in opposition to other ideas, not for an idea. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, it seems like people will yeah. bond together over things they hate quicker. Even things that, yeah, I mean, we see it all the time. I mean, people in Philadelphia, where I'm from, they bond about their hatred against the Patriots or the Giants. <laughs> it's, you know, yeah. it's, it's just yeah, that's what I mean. It's like, right, exactly. Yeah. There was a website that was popular a couple of years ago called Hate Book. They set it up to look like Facebook. And it was, you can go on there and you make groups about things you hate. Of course, it got pretty vile because mm. it got pretty racist and fascist and stuff like that. But it was amazing to see how many people would join these groups of things that they hate. Well, I guess that's an important point because I really want to reiterate that these tools can be used for evil and used for good. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Yeah, they can be used for those reasons. At the same time, you can make your object of hate an idea, and it doesn't really have to be hate. So to give you an example, I wasn't going to spend much time on this tactic, but I think it's worth it. Yeah. Yeah. There's a company called Basecamp that you may or may not have heard of. I have, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, a boring company, the company's not boring at all, but the field, it's project management. It's a tool that helps you manage your projects, a software. And what's different about their product is that it's simple. It only does a few things, but it does them very well. Mm -hmm. So before the guys who started that company started writing about this subject, the whole idea in project management was that when your client said jump, you said how high, and you built that new functionality into the tool. Mm -hmm. And so the more the tool did, the better it was. So they had 52 functions on (laughs) on the thing. And What these guys did is they took it even past project management software. They wrote a book called Rework that basically said, fire your workaholics, have a four-day work week, simplicity is king, all of this stuff. (laughs) Well, for better or worse. I I understand that, but I'd be firing most of my company if I took that advice. (laughs) Max, you're safe. Don't worry. (laughs) That's my least used word. No, exactly. I mean, and we can disagree with it. Exactly. The fact that you guys were shaking your head, it hit a nerve. I mean, that's the whole point. And so they're not saying don't work hard. They're saying that people add layers of complexity to things that extend their workday and they're not effective. Well, what's the perfect solution for that? A tool that simplifies everything, right? Mm -hmm. So they didn't call out people by name. They didn't insult anybody, but they called out a way of operating. They called out your kind of working. Uh Uh-huh. So okay. it's sort of um, 
there's a phrase I am looking for. Diminishing returns, essentially. It's yeah. Essentially, at some point, you put in so much that you'd been as well stopping five hours ago on your 10-hour day, not your 15-hour day. That's half of it. And the other half is that people have to work harder because they're disorganized and they overcomplicate things, is their idea. I'm not yeah, saying actually, that that's correct, but that's what yeah. they say. No, but actually, I mean, so I'm not going to generalize. I'll speak about myself. There's a lot of truth to that, that the days that I wake up early and I have my lists in order and I get things done in the times that they were scheduled, my days go amazingly productive. But then you have days like, you know, today where we wake up, none of our tech's working, right. you know, the internet drops. We start this whole thing 25 minutes later than we, right. which is going to push the whole day back more, right? And it will feel stressed until the end of the day. So I can get behind that thought. You know, it's like, yeah, when you are more efficient, you can get more done in less time. But sometimes efficiency is out of my control. And that's a great point. Let's go back to hype. If these guys would have phrased their thing as, you know, sometimes efficiency is out of your control, but it would be better if you were more efficient, no one would listen to them. It's mm -hmm. that they spoke in these very definitive words. I mean, I'll give you an example. I know we're a little yeah. all over the map, but no, that's okay. That's so okay. I wrote a book when I was 18 years old that was published and it did not sell well, but it was published with uh, Macmillan. And one of the reasons it didn't sell well is because I'm an idiot. So it was, <laughs> it was a team where I was an idiot. It's a humorous driver's manual for teenagers. And I was a teenager when I wrote it. I was in my dorm room in college, which had a, you know, phone that you plug into the wall. And my phone rang. What's that? No. Yeah. <laughs> and the phone rang and a woman who I had never, who I didn't know who she was said hello. And it, she goes, this is whatever from the Oprah Winfrey show. I kid you not. And I was like, yes. And she goes, we're doing a show on whether the driving age should be raised to 17. And we want to know what you think, because we found out about your book. And what did I say? Well, on one hand, I think that it should be raised for this reason. And on the other hand, I think it should be low, the same because of this. And she said, well, we'll call you back. And she never did. Yeah. So that's what I really thought. But People think people want things simplified. Mm -hmm. They trust confidence. It's like a mental heuristic. And I don't mean personal confidence. Like you have to bark at people. I just mean yeah. using qualifying words and showing both sides of the story. That's not good hype, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, so if you answered that question with, don't think we should raise the age because I wanted to drive and this is the way and young people need freedom or whatever. They probably would have had you on the show and we wouldn't even be having this conversation. Yeah, I'd be on my 18th driving manual yeah. drinking <laughs> myself to death because right. I wanted yeah. to be writing novels. Yeah. yeah, you wouldn't be here talking to us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so for the face of things then, yeah. neutral is not attractive. Take a definitive stance, take a position and your position is somewhat mischievous in most cases how do you get there do you start in neutral and go one way or do you does it just come naturally and you don't think about it i think about it you do to the extent that yeah i mean my point of view is that if you want to really be good at marketing mm -hmm. don't look at marketers look at the people who are really good at getting attention and driving emotion mm -hmm. who don't consider themselves marketers. And it is a mischievous point of view. So I co-hosted a podcast called Access to Anyone, and I loved every minute of it. I'm still friends with the co-host. It does well, but I had to step away from it. And it was a really hard decision. And I stepped away because it was a little bit too soft, meaning the show is wonderful, but it's about how do you meet people and form relationships with them and this and that, which is something I'm also good at. But I had to decide at a certain point, what do I want to be known for? It wasn't consistent with my point of view. And again, I love the show. It's yeah. still going strong. I'm very proud of it. Yeah. Yeah. That's an interesting thought process. I think without all your knowledge, I fell into that same thing by mistake, which ended up being very fortunate for us as a company, because when I started this, everyone was a pen tester and we were mm -hmm. all doing everything. And I said, I'm going to focus just on the human side. And it was unheard of. Nobody was doing that. I didn't know. Look back 12 years. I didn't know 12 years was going to go by and it was going to be a whole industry and I'm going to have five books and blah, blah, blah. I didn't know any of that. We got lucky. 
So like what you just said really resonated with me because it's like, I don't disparage anyone that stayed in that industry. They're all still having great careers, helping yeah. people. But I just got lucky to make that decision. And it's an interesting way of thinking about it. It actually worked for you. I know that just as an outsider, because I know somebody who's in the security space and they use the term social engineering. So I brought you up and said I was going to be on the show. And they said, oh, yeah, he came up with that term. <laughs> cool. And I didn't. <laughs> okay. But that's then so good for you. That's what you're known for. Yeah. 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 So yeah. what's funny is, is that people credit me with that all the time. And the crazy part is, is social engineering was a term used in the late 1800s, but it was not towards security. It was towards political engineering oh, yeah. of social events. Right. And then it got adopted when Kevin Mitnick got arrested <laughs> for hacking the FBI and phone companies and all that stuff. And that was in the nineties. I was a young person just yeah. getting into trouble myself, you know? So <laughs> like, you know, now I just made it really popular is all I did. But then people credit me for that. But man, now I'm thinking, how can we hype that? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, that's great. I mean, you did a good job maybe by accident, but I think part of it by was accident. being known for that thing and nothing else. If you would have been known for that and 15 other things, right. I don't think it would have worked as well for you. Yeah. So, Mike, I have another question based on this. So we've said that you take a position, right? And it's sort of definitive. Can you flip-flop anytime? Are you allowed to change your mind and take a new position? Or do you have to stay with your guns? Stick. That's a great point. I've not, real, I've not thought about it. I mean, you're, of course, allowed to do whatever you want. And I'm sure that that's a great way to get publicity. My mm -hmm. hunch is that you'd have to be known... Yeah. for that position a lot. So in other words, let's use Chris. And again, now I'm just talking based mm -hmm. on my experience and just thought experiments. Let's say you were as known as you are through social engineering, and then you were known more and more and more. And then you got on big talk shows, not just in the community, and were known as yeah. the social engineering guy, and you had this point of view. And then one day, you said, you know what, I've had a revelation, and everything I said is wrong. I guess on one hand, you'd have to have something pretty good to replace it, because what were you talking about before? On the other hand, you could turn into Chris Gaines. Do you remember him? I do, but I don't know why. Exactly. I know that that was Garth Brooks. Remember, he tried to reinvent oh, himself as Chris oh. Gaines. I knew the name, but I could not, I could not like remember destroy why. his career. Right? Yeah. So I don't know. I, I wouldn't say it's one of the high principles. I don't see it a lot. David Bowie did that a lot. Yeah. You know, but I think that's art. And that was, yeah, that's a great question. I'm not sure I have the answer. Yeah, it, I liked your analogy with Garth Brooks, because I think we all knew the name, but no yeah. reason why. But you say, I don't like country music, but I know who Garth Brooks is. Yeah, of course. But when yeah. you say Chris Gaines, I'm like, nah, I know the name, but why do I know it? I probably read an article about that screwing up his career. Mm -hmm. And I agree with your assessment. Like if I came out and said, everything I said was wrong, there are people who credit me for their career. Like they have a job now because of books they read. Right. And if I went out and said, everything I said was wrong, I just took all those people's lives and invalidated mm -hmm. it. I better have something really good to replace it. Yeah. So, so you have a great point. So I think in art, it's a little bit different. I mean, Garth Brooks failed, but Bowie was just such a genius that every one of his phases was great. But you see people reinventing themselves in music a lot. Mm -hmm. And they don't do it skillfully and they're often forgotten, yeah. right? When you're selling ideas and belief systems, that's really tricky to yeah. change 100% because you're basically saying everything I said before, I was either too ignorant to test my assumptions properly or I was lying. And that's hard, right? I mean, there was a guy, I didn't write about this guy in the book, but I came across him in my research. He was named Sabatai Zevi. And it was in the Middle Ages. He was Jewish in the like shtetls, in the ghettos of Eastern Europe. And he basically persuaded a good portion of the Jewish population of the time that he was the Messiah. And it created this massive, massive furor and uproar. And then I think either the Turkish government or something persecuted him and he recanted everything and converted to Islam. And he is still cursed in Hasidic communities. The Hasidic movement actually formed as a response to this guy. And he's still really? considered like the most disgusting individual 
you know, yeah. in that world. He was completely discredited and just hated and mm-hmm. not believed in. So I don't know. You could be a sabotage Zevi if, if you're not careful. Yeah, it's going to yeah. be done with a lot of skill. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a valid point, you know, is that if – not on that level, but me and this guy in the community have this argument and it's not a bad argument, but he thinks that social engineering always involves deception. And I say it doesn't. And I've said that for 12 years of my career now. And he says the other one for 12 years of his career. To me, when you were talking, I would think that would be like me coming out into my whole community saying, okay, guys, I've converted. Social engineering always involves deception which would then invalidate much of my work, which is leave them feeling better for having met you because it's really hard to do that when you're deceiving people and it would have a trickle effect. And that would be a really hard hype to spin. Sounds like fraud almost when you're like reversing your ideas like that. I don't mean legitimate fraud, but it feels like fraud. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I agree. I agree. So that would be, yeah, I could see that. So, okay, give us another (laughs) principle of hype that is in your book. So another principle is one that I call create a secret society, or I sometimes call it the the piggybacking method. So what I have realized is that a lot of times people who are trying to promote themselves often try to build a following person by person. So it's the first question you hear when people come to me more than anything else. They'll say, how do I do this social media thing? And (laughs) I'll say, what do you mean by that? They like build a big following on social media. And what I found is that the best hype artists, the most effective hype artists always make it seem like what they're doing is grassroots, but they almost always have a network behind the scenes that's closer than just networking, like a hardcore group that they've built who will pull strings for them and who they'll pull strings for other people. So there's a great story that I used to illustrate this. So there was a guy named Edward Bernays. Have you ever heard of him? I don't know why. That name rings a bell, but I don't have any recollection of why I do. So don't feel bad that you don't know of him. He was actually called by Time Magazine the most influential 20th century American that no one knows about. Wow. (laughs) That's an interesting title to have. (laughs) Yeah. so, So Edward Bernays was known as the father of public relations because he invented public relations. And in fact, He came up with that term because his original term, which was called propaganda, fell into disfavor after the many regimes that took it. So he renamed it public relations, which is pretty funny to all the PR people out there. So this guy is responsible for women smoking. Before he came around, women smoking was a complete taboo, and he did a campaign for Lucky Strike, where he had suffragettes smoking in a parade, calling it Torches for Liberty, like show that, you know, you won't be told what to do by any man. And, you know, everyone started smoking. Um, (laughs) He he engineered to have the government of, I believe, Guatemala overthrown for the United Fruit Company. But the one that really illustrates this principle is he had a client, his client was Beechnut, who was one of the major producers in the country at the time. And before the 20s, Americans didn't typically eat bacon for breakfast. So he did a campaign for Beechnut. He had this doctor who he had spent years forming this really strong relationship with who had himself connections with 5,000 doctors across the country. So he had this doctor commission a study, quote unquote, (laughs) that bacon is the perfect breakfast food that you health because it replaces the energy that you lose during sleep. So this doctor sent out this study. So 5,000 doctors across America were recommending bacon to their patients, no advertising, nothing. And it changed the dietary habits of the country. So my point here is not to lie. It's not to make up a study. I mean, he was a pretty sinister guy, actually, Edward Bernays. However, the fact that he could get that much pull based on his under the surface relationships is extremely important. So I think a few ways to do this in the modern age, which are just so available to us in ways that they weren't before. The way I use social media, for example, I don't really care about followers. What I'll do is I'll go on Twitter and I'll just monitor people that I really want to know. And again, the point isn't that they can do anything for me right away. It's that everyone says in business, it's who you know, build an old boys network. Well, you can build your own old boys network or old girls network or whatever you want to call it. 
I'll monitor these people and I'll wait until they say something that's human. That's not about business that I have something in common with. Cause even business people will connect. If you talk about a favorite band in common, a favorite sports team, a favorite hobby, and I'll talk to them about that. And then I do what you would do for any friend, make introductions, do favors, that sort of thing. And before long, I have access to these people that I never would have had access to. Similarly, I do what you do and I use my media to make connections. So I write columns for various publications. I did it with you. Yeah. So I never do it this yeah, I'm, I'm hearing thing. your stories and I'm like, wait, you did this. On <laughs> yeah, I did this it. How you got here right now. <laughs> so I the can, I talk, can I talk about it? Am I allowed to talk about yeah, it? Yeah, please. Uh, that's, that's an amazing example. And again, I never do and it. With before people. you tell the story, yeah. let me just say one thing. We get about probably somewhere between three to five requests a week that all get rejected. Yeah. We always pick our own guests. So I'm just letting everyone that's listening know that this actually worked on me. Yeah. That's what I do for a living, dang it. <laughs> <laughs> and what I should say is, what I should say before you think I'm, I fooled you or messed with you. No, no, I don't think I, that. And I want to say this to the audience. I never do what I'm going to talk about if I didn't believe, like, I think your show is amazing. It wasn't like I made something up. So let me put it in context. Yeah. So I write a column for Psychology Today. Now, I happen to write a column for Psychology Today, but you could start a podcast, you could do it with a blog, you could do it with whatever you have. I have this column. So I wrote an email to Chris. I had about a hundred, I don't know, a hundred people on this list that would have fit the bill. And I said to him, I'm writing a column for Psychology Today that's going to be the top 25, I think I said was the number, top 25 psychology podcasts that business people should listen to. You're on my short list. Will you talk to me? And then I said, real quick on the bottom, oh, by the way, I also have a book coming out. It'd be cool, you know, if maybe you'd consider me for your show. So we got on the phone or on Zoom. And we talked for 45 minutes about the article, which is going to be written in a couple of weeks. And then I said, oh, by the way, no connection whatsoever to the article, which is true, other than the fact that I really wanted to be on the show. But if he had said no, <laughs> he would still have been in the article because the show makes the cut. I said, but would you consider having me on your show? And he said, I think send me the book. And now I'm on the show. Yeah. So what was at play there? There's the old influence law of reciprocity yep. that Robert Cialdini talks about. But also there's just the idea that human beings want exposure and they want their ego stroke. And it just works very, very well. So think in terms of giving up something that you have that's cheap for you to give up and easy for you to give up, but that's very valuable to someone else. And there's always something. I knew this guy, Dave Lindsay, who owned a company that was a half billion dollar company. And this was in the beginning of my career. So I had nothing I thought I could offer him. And I interviewed him for Forbes or, or something. And he told me he had just moved to New York and he really loved music and he'd love to know if there are any places. So I was like, oh, I happen to know about some clubs in New York. And I started to show him around town and he became like one of my biggest mentors. Mm -hmm. So that was really easy for me to give him. It was like very valuable for him, even though this guy was half a billionaire. You know, on the back end of your story, let me tell you how it worked here is we use psychology today all the time because we are always basing our stuff in science and research. So right away you had me with the, Oh, this guy writes for like one of my favorite websites, you know, that we use constantly in our company. Yeah. So like, yeah. And then when you are saying, you know, you're on my short list for a podcast that I love for this topic, I'm thinking, well, this is something we've been pushing for is to yeah. get, you know, not just to be an infosec. So you hit two hot points without knowing, without you possibly being able to know. Then you know, because we get three to five requests a week, when I said, send me your book, both myself, and then I usually will try to read like a chapter or two really quick. And then I pass it to this woman, Amanda in the company who helps me do all the scheduling. You met her. Mm -hmm. And I say, hey, give this a quick read and tell me if you think it fits our podcast. And she read it and came back. She goes, this is really good. She goes, yeah, like, that's really nice to hear. Yeah, yeah. She's like, did you meet this guy? And I said, yeah, yeah, I met him. I said, we had a conversation for like 40 minutes. And she goes, well, does he speak intelligently? I'm like, yeah, I think he'd be great on the show. <laughs> so she's like, okay, I'll book him, you know? That's, that's cool. Yeah, that's, that's a nice compliment. No, I was just going to say, because on the back end, we always get these people who want to come on, but yeah. their sales pitch is something like, we made this piece of software and I'd love to come on and talk about how it can secure your listeners. And I'm like, well, that's not really what we do. I mean, 11 years, we haven't done that. So I'm like, nah, reject, reject. But 
And then sometimes we get people who are new authors who say, hey, can I come on and promote my book? And I say, send it to me. I read it. And I'm like, oh, boy, this is just not the kind of stuff. So when I read your title, I was like, ooh, I don't know if I want to get into cult leaders and property. <laughs> yeah, and all this stuff. But then when I started yeah. reading it, I'm like, oh, this is actually really – this is really cool. So I'm like, okay, Amanda, take it over. And from the back end, your story also worked because everything you said wasn't just false hype. That's the point I wanted to make to the listeners here is because you didn't just say something to get in and then send me a crappy book to get in. Everything you said was true. And then it followed through with the principles of what we were looking for. So it worked out. That is so important. So a lot of times when people think of hype, they mean exactly what you were talking about, the negative side of it. It's the idea that you're hyping something up that isn't good, that there's nothing there. So why did I use that term? I actually was inspired by hip hop because, yeah, well, in rap, there's always someone in the group called the hype man. And the hype man is not seen as a negative thing. The hype man gets the crowd excited, gets the street teams going. And what it said to me is that, you know, hip hop was started in the South Bronx. It was people who were on the margins. Cool. And, and it's now the predominant art form in the country and mm-hmm. biggest star is worth a billion dollars. So I kind of wanted to take hype back. And if you're in any kind of disadvantaged position for any reason, hype is a tool you can use, but yeah, you should have the stuff to back it up. Right. If you can't rap, you know, if you can't drop bars, then uh, <laughs> you know, eventually yeah. you're going to be. You're I'm gonna not going to promote myself as an ex Eminem. So it's not going to happen. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I think, though, that's such a valid point because when we talk about social engineering and we talk about it from the positive side, we always say that you can't make things up that aren't true. Right. Because when it comes out to be a falsehood, you have wrecked all your reciprocity, all your rapport, all your influence. Exactly. All of those things are now in the toilet because they caught you in a lie. And that does the opposite of everything you've been trying to do. So I think that's a really valuable lesson in the way that you hyped yourself and your work to get here. It was a, I think that's a really great story to be shared. So mm-hmm. Especially now, right? I yeah. mean, if you do one shady thing, truly shady thing, it's going to be lamba- you know, broadcast all over every social media channel that there is. Yeah. Yeah. And you'll have to fight really hard. I've had this happen to me too. Just so you say one dumb thing and it's everywhere. Yeah. And you got to work quick and be really humble to fix that. Otherwise you're going to be eating it for the rest of your life. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's really fascinating. So, okay. Off the topic question. What's your favorite music now? I always thought I would be that guy who was always keeping up with the new bands and stuff. I never thought I would age out of that. And I just don't, I still love music, but I listen to the stuff I listened to Yeah, growing up, but I'm broad taste. I mean, I love, I have an aesthetic, I guess. I mean, I came up through punk, so I don't only listen to punk, but I like like wiry, punchy music. Like I like the first half of the Beatles better than the second half of the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> but what's your favorite punk band? My favorite band is actually the Dead Milkmen. Have you ever oh, heard yeah, of them? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They're, um, they're my favorite all-time band. They were the first I listened to, the first show I went to. They're from Philly, where I'm from. Yeah. So they got back together not long ago, and they're like old men, but I go whenever they play. I really like them a I lot. I understand that. Like, um, yeah. uh, Bad Religion was a favorite one of mine. Do you like, Yeah, they're great. So are yeah. you into that kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm more into rock and yeah. roll than punk, but when Me I was too. younger and I was a skater, I used to listen to – bad religion all the time and we used to go to all their shows and yeah they're great and now they still play and they're like i'm like oh wait you look like me you're not a kid anymore it's yeah. really weird you go to see these punk bands it's not they're not even rock bands like yeah. like the stones they're like punk bands and they're they're old you know it's just but funny. they sound I mean, the same they sound the same and they're singing about whatever huffing gas or whatever yeah <laughs> they're, they're i know it's, it's crazy yeah. like bad the dude from beverly he sounds exactly the same as or the did. descendants or they're playing still yeah. or yeah i liked all that stuff it was funny the misfits filled an arena you never thought that would happen yeah i know yeah. well you know it comes back around what i find is like the kids now start liking the music that we like that was unpopular and yeah. now it becomes popular, like kind of like 80s clothing is coming yeah, back, which is awful. Yeah. That should not happen. You yeah. know what's funny, though? I have a 10-year-old daughter, and she hates rock music. <laughs> I, mean, I did a terrible job. I guess she does it to torture me. She says, 
anytime I put it on, she's like, oh, put on pop, you know, this is terrible. <laughs> this is music. And right. rap, I like too. She, that's yeah. not music. And even the Beatles, I, we were in the car and the Beatles came on. I said, you know, your grandma, when she was little, all the girls your age would scream for this. She goes, I wouldn't have. <laughs> <laughs> it is sad. I, my, my, oh, yeah. I, my favorite band is Clutch and my son and I will go oh, cool. see yeah, all their shows, right? Yeah. But my daughter, I can't get her into them and I've tried every way possible. Didn't they do an online thing recently? Yeah, now? yeah, they've done three Someone so far. Someone told me about that. Yeah, they yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah, they really they pulled out because you know it, live music has kind of been dead this year. So I know bands that make all of their money doing that need to get with the time. Yeah. What about you, Maxi? What do you like? Same as yourself. I have a sort of broad range, but I like British punk a little bit better. I like the Sex yeah. Pistols and oh, the best, Eddie. Yeah. But yes, I... The Sex Pistols are, the be- are fantastic. Did you ever get to Eddie and the Hot Rods? They were... Like, yeah, yeah. They were, yeah. they were like, what was that, pub rock? Is yeah, that pub rock. That? Exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I listened to just That's about... like fighting music. Yeah, very much. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of the best... best dropkick murder. Yeah, you can't yeah. listen to them and not punch someone. No. Or Coxbar. Have you ever heard of them? <laughs> no, I haven't, no. <laughs> They're like, England belongs to me. I'm, I'm, yeah, very uh, like soccer music, football music. <laughs> <laughs> football music wait i'm trying to think who's the biggest bands out who are the biggest bands out of scotland the proclaimers the proclaimers so bands are a different snow patrol has some sort of ties snow patrol in scotland they've got some ties i think they went to like a uh, university in scotland i think oh, it was okay. and we've got i was gonna get i was gonna say a stupid thing and say tom jones but he's from wales We'll accept that. That's <laughs> as long as it's not like actual UK, they'll accept it. Yeah, as long as it's not England. Not like <laughs> London. You, know? yeah, you, you can't know. say someone from London is Scottish because then yeah, they but... pull out their claymore and cut you in yeah. half. <laughs> I'm thinking, you know, Ireland's got a bunch. I'm trying to think of Scotland. We should start a music show after this. Yes. <laughs> but Oasis is so, probably a very good one. Oh, they're not Scottish, really? No, they're not Scottish, they're English, but we accept them because they're from Northern they're from the North English. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I know there's that line. Like, where well, you accept going. the Beatles <laughs> since they're from the North? We'll accept the Beatles too, yes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Anyhow. I know, North England, I have a friend from, I don't remember what town she's from, but she's from way in the North of England, and her voice is sort of in between your accent and a Liverpool accent. It's kind Ooh. of Scottishy. Yeah, I think it blurs when you get to the north, right? You get the more north. We've made Scottish an adjective. It's Scottish. It's Scottish. <laughs> Scottish. You wouldn't it just be Scottish? Yeah, it's Scottish. 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 Scotch. No, it's Scotch. It's like Scotch whiskey. Yes. Oh, don't get me started. Don't get me started. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Scotland is one of my favorite places on earth. So, anyhow, let's talk about this question that I have. Do you have any colleagues that you just really look up to, people that you say this is somebody you've learned a lot from, you respect the most, one of your colleagues that you really like the most? Yeah, there's a gentleman named Michael Roderick, who was my co-host on the podcast that I mentioned before. And he is both one of the greatest people and also someone smartest and people who's worth knowing. So Mm -hmm. his business for years. So he was a high school English teacher who decided he wanted to be a Broadway producer. Mm -hmm. This was years ago. And he made that happen in two years. And the reason he was able to do that was through connecting. He is just so good at helping people and connecting them and sort of that piggybacking method, but not as mischievous is my approach, just being the the most generous guy in the world. And recently he's come up with a concept that's really caught fire called referable brand. He teaches you how to make your brand referable so that there's, Mm. you know, Mm. referability baked into it. And he's, after years of having a great career, this is the thing that's really taken off. He's just all over with this thing. And I just really admire him and he's, he's been. That's cool. That sounds great. Thank Thank you. you Yeah. One of the things we always ask our guests, because we have 11 years now, we've had our listeners are avid readers. So we've been collecting a list of books. And of course, your book will be in our list. But do you have any other books that you've read recently? They don't have to even be on this topic. It can just yeah. be something you read that you loved or 
I'm a really, really avid reader. I know it's funny because reading has become kind of a fad now, it seems like yeah. in business, maybe because of people like Ryan Holiday. But I remember going to get books when I was a kid, like on vacation and asking if there was a bookstore and telling like the desk clerk at the hotel that I, it was for a school project because I didn't want to be caught seen like as a nerd, you know, for getting a book <laughs> on vacation. <laughs> so I'm always reading all kinds of stuff. So I'll do one that's totally on topic and one that's vaguely on topic. There's a book called The Crowd by an author named Gustav Laban. It's old. It's from 1896. And essentially, this guy saw the Paris Commune burn Paris to the ground just in this inflamed mob, and he couldn't understand it. And he spent the rest of his life figuring out how crowds work and what they respond to. And it's funny because that book is partially the reason that I wrote my book. It was years ago. I was on a business trip and it was one of the first Trump debates, primary debates. And I was reading this book, kind of flipping through it and watching this debate against 20 other people or whatever. And the book would say things like crowds respond to vague, emotional, future focused language that you can put your own meaning into. Crowds respond to prestige, symbols of prestige. When there's no prestige, money is an excellent substitute. And I remember watching this thing and being like, this guy's going to win. And I started telling people that and they're like, you're an idiot. You don't know what you're talking about. And so that book is a really good primer to understanding crowd psychology. I've never heard of that one. That's interesting. Thank you. There's a book I'm reading now, which I think your listeners will maybe like. It's called The Masters of Atlantis by Charles Portis. So it's the same author who wrote True Grit that they made the Western out of, but he's a very funny writer. But what it's basically about is in World War I, there's this soldier who's like kind of a down and out kind of guy. And this homeless person accosts him on the street and thrusts this ratty book into his hands and said it's like the secret masters of Atlantis and this weird philosophy. So the guy basically goes home and takes the book and creates this secret society and new religion around the book that this homeless guy put into his hands. And it's all about like how do crazy new beliefs and charlatans and these sort of things start, but in a very funny and interesting novel. So I recommend that. I'm I'm having a lot of fun with that book. Thank you, Michael. So Mike, if our listeners want to know more about you, they want to follow you, they want to, you know, just learn more about what you're doing, where can they go? Yeah, well, there's a couple of places. It's funny that you talk about books, because one of the things I do that I think is among the most popular things I do, I I have a thing called the Hype Book Club. So Mm. People sign up and I send all my book recommendations on these topics, not the typical seven habits of highly effective people kind of books. Yeah, That's how I keep in touch with people. And it's become really a book club. It went from being a list, but everyone trades ideas and trades emails. And that's hypereads.com slash list. You know, my company is microfamemedia.com. I have a website, michaelfshine.com, S-C-H-E-I-N. That's all the author stuff. Mm -hmm. And of course, my book is on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and bookstores, the whole deal. That's awesome. Mike, Mike, this was fascinating. And anyone who's listening, we only covered like two or three out of the 12 principles in the book. So if you want to know the rest, you're going to have to go buy it and read it. And I suggest doing that. I'm working my way through it now. And it, it is a really, really good read. And you will don't get dissuaded by the title for all of you positive thinkers out there. There's a lot of great <laughs> info on there and how to use this in a very positive way. Mm-hmm. And you'll make the connections really quick. So, Michael, thanks for coming on the show. This was really awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks to the two of you. I truly enjoyed this. Okay. Well, Max. Another one. Another, another one down. It's great. <laughs> I love it. That was so good. If you want to follow Maxi, it's on Twitter. That's a good question, isn't it? It is. <laughs> Maxie Reynolds. Okay, let is me help that, you out with your own Twitter. Maxie Reynolds. Yes, that's basic. So I don't really use that a lot. Go to Instagram. Go to Instagram where it's also Maxie.Reynolds. Oh, wow. Isn't that amazing? Okay, I'm Human Hacker, our corporate is SOC or Engineer Inc. And on Instagram, we are Social Engineer LLC. You can find all of our info on social-engineer.org or social-engineer.com. Of course, we always love when you support the Innocent Lives Foundation. You can find out more information on innocentlivesfoundation.org. Give a shout out for Clutch, giving us the permission to use them as our intro and outro music. You can check them out on prorock.com. I think that's it. We'll see you. I was going to say next month, but we're doing two of these a month now.
So we'll see you in a couple weeks. See ya. Family didn't sell.